I am personally really excited to learn about how you function as a comedian. Um, you know, Viagra. Uh, Viagra. That's, that's how it. I function. <laughs> I'm at that age. <laughs> Welcome to another episode of Wild Truth. I have a guest that I'm very excited to have a talk with today, Mike Binder. Yes. Thank you so much, buddy, for joining me today. Mike is a multifaceted talent, a veteran of comedy, director, producer, actor. He's done it all. I'm very excited to Thanks dive into this. Thanks for having me here. This of is course, great. Of course, of course. Mike, I feel like uh, I have so much in common with you. I yeah. feel like I'm the mini version of you. Yeah, yeah, no, no, it's just, <laughs> the more I get to see you, yes. yeah. I love it. I love it. I feel like I can sit down. Uh, so Mike joined me today about two o'clock, and I feel like uh, we've been chatting over an hour before even we sit down on the chair, which is so amazing because, you know, um, when you when you have so much in common with, with someone that's in your industry, time flies. Yeah. You know, we sit down with comics, we talk for hours, Yep. you know, and, and you look at the time and you go, gosh, I thought I'm going to sleep early tonight. And next thing you know, 3 a.m. you get home. Yeah, no, we're, we're very lucky. It's a great, it's a great community to be a part of. And, and comics, even filmmakers, you know, when you, when you have a mutual love for something, you, there's a bond. It's like that, you know? Absolutely. When, when I came out here from Detroit when I was a kid, I was friends with all these comics, black comics, uh, a Russian comic, uh, you know, whatever, you know, women. You know, we didn't, we weren't think, we were the minority. We were, we, we, we were our own minority, you know, That's because right. comics, it was such a small group of comics and I never thought anything, uh, he's black, he's Mexican, uh, you know, I, he's another comic, you That's know, right. and we had so much, that's a whole different level, like, like when you know someone and you know someone's life. That's the beauty of comedy. And that's the beauty of any community. When you're a small niche of, of artist, you don't, you, you know, you're all so obsessed about your art and you're learning so much from each other that you don't see anything else. And that's, that's beautiful. I want to focus uh, today's talk uh, about, um, I, I am personally really excited to learn about how you function because um as a comedian um you know uh, viagra viagra that's, that's how i function <laughs> i'm at that age <laughs> no okay. um no sorry sorry you, no that's perfect okay. now, now i know what the recipe is <laughs> no no okay <laughs> i just think um you know it's so wonderful to see you know you started as a stand-up and now you're still doing your stand-up but meanwhile you've created some of the most incredible projects movies that was obviously part of your passion but i want to see how how did this start like you were doing stand-up first then you got gravitated towards you know movie making and producing and directing yeah well obviously when i was a kid it was woody allen and albert brooks and robert klein you know and they were three Jewish guys, you know, I was in Detroit. I, I didn't know anyone in show business, but those guys were running the business at the time and Mel Brooks, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so I wanted to be a comedian because I saw Woody Allen come out as a comedian. I saw, and I loved Robert Klein's albums. Then I just started thinking, you know, when I was a kid, when I did, st I did stand up from the time I was maybe 16 or 17 to my early 30s, and I did very well, but I wasn't taking it serious enough that I was writing a new hour here. You know, I, I had one act and I did it, you know, and uh, I started writing screenplays and it was like, wow, once I finish it, go on to something else, it's like a blank page. And I loved that. And mm. I was getting movies made. I was getting acting work is, uh, on shows and stuff. And I just said, okay, I, don't, I have to focus on one thing or the other. So I let my stand up go. So let me ask you this. When you first started, what was what did you talk about on stage? Well, I, I talked about being 17. You know, I okay. talked about getting girls. God, you were so young. Yeah, I was just a kid. You know, I talked about uh, about why my parents think I'm crazy. You know, I talked about smoking pot. You know, I mean, but I was, it was a novelty act. You know, I mean, but you have to have one thing that makes you different from everyone else. And mm -hmm. that made me different from everyone else, you know, because I was so young. 
Mm. And um, there was a show called Make Me Laugh that got really popular for a while, for a couple of years. It was on five nights a week, syndicated across the country. And all the comedians did it, you know, and they'd uh, come out and make a contestant laugh. Shan- Gary Shanling and Howie Mandel and Bob Saget, all my friends, they, they, you know all those guys, right? Yes, of course. And w- they all did it, and we would shoot five episodes in one day. So, wow. And, but I was the young kid, and I, I popped on that. So I, they kept having me back and back and back. And we, that group of comedians, because that show was playing all around the country at 11 o'clock at night, in a time when audiences were done with the news for a while, there was no big news thing, and they just were newsed out. It was so fresh for them to watch this crazy stand-up comedy contest show every night. But a bunch of nightclubs throughout the country opened around it. Mark Ridley's Comedy Castle in Detroit and the punchlines in, in the, the, you know, and we went out and headlined clubs, right? So I was 19 years old, 20 years old. I'd go all around the country. I could sell out these clubs and it was a great time for me. Wow, you, know? you were already selling out clubs Oh from yeah, from the the appearance on TV. Well, we were on TV five nights a week, and I was, oh. and I, and I, I probably, I, w- I probably would do fifteen episode weeks a year. Oh wow! You know, so wow. as it, you know, and so yeah, we'd go out to a club, and we'd do really well. You know, all the guys from our show, and it really, uh, it, it was a great time. It was a great time, but m- to be honest, I was also a young kid, and I was getting high and drinking and. You know, and I wasn't taking it serious enough. You know, it, it came too easy for me. Like, right from the beginning, man, I, you know, the, the Tonight Show, and it just came too easy for me. I, w- I wanted to party and, and meet girls, you know? Well, you were, you were young. I was a kid. You were in the entertainment business. Right. And I think that era was also partying yeah. was a big part of the scene. It was not, a huge part. Now it's very different. Yeah, it was a that. huge part. And plus... Then what? But one thing when I got into making movies and met directors and producers and, and people on sets, they were completely their work ethic was completely different from than all my comedian friends who we'd <laughs> sleep till two or three in the afternoon and you know these people work so hard and they, yeah. you know they're so much so dedicated and and then I got sober I I cleaned up you know and I, how old I was probably twenty five or twenty six oh, when good. I got sober. I've been sober 38 years. Beautiful. You know, wow. and, and um, but so I had this incredible work ethic as a filmmaker. Give us the for, details. For Mike, many years. Uh, you wh- know, wh- what hit that you said, I need to become sober? I just wasn't taking it serious and it was obvious. And uh, I had an agent. I had a, I had the biggest agent in stand up in comedy. His name was Marty Klein. He managed me and. Steve Martin and Seinfeld and wow. and he loved me. He loved me, and he called me up one day. And said, "I'm dropping you as a client." Oh wow! And what do you, I was like 24. What are you talking about? He goes, I, "I just woke you up, didn't I?" I went, "No, no." He goes, "Yeah, I did. I can hear in your voice." He goes, "You, you, you know, you're not taking this serious, and you're drinking and taking drugs, and I just don't want anything to do with it, you know." I, I really, I, 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 he said, I never drop people. I wait for them to just drop me. I just don't do any. I've never actually said, I want to take this person off my list. Mm. I said, but I'm doing it with you because I don't, I just, I don't see it happening for you until you change your life. And it was just such a, a wake up call to me, you know? I mean, there were other things too. I, I was standing in front of the comedy store one night, just hired and, and drunk, and I tried to, be funny in front of all these comedians. I mooned these cops driving by and they, and it like a jump cut. I was in the back of the car heading to, to jail for indecent exposure. So, the, I mean, things were, things weren't going my way, <laughs> you know? I'm sure it made the comics laugh. Though. Oh yeah, they did. And then, and it's really funny. It's really funny. This, I was in, in this holding cell with this woman they put men some, and women in the same holding cell. It was cell? just, yeah, it was just. Oh a, my you god! Know, it, it Times was, have changed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and she had was there for. Uh, she had slapped a neighbor's kid, got in an <laughs> argument with a kid, and 
And so she was there, you know, they had arrested her for, you know, whatever. And I'm making all these jokes to her and teasing her, go, hey, you're, you're, so you're a pedophile, basically. I, I mean, it's a different version of it, you know. And uh, she came over, she was drunk, and I was drunk, but she was drunk. And she came over and beat the living shit out of me. She was kicking me and punching me. And Whoa. Just, and then Mitzi Shore, the owner of the comedy store at the time, bailed me out in the middle of the night. Oh, she wow. came down in a robe, you know. She, she goes, I, I, gotta, I gotta change my life. I, I can't do this. This is not how I was raised. And she was, she had heard about this fight I was in with this woman. And I said, yeah. She said, have a little empathy. The woman had a bad night, you know. And I said, yeah, I'm gonna stop drinking. She goes, yeah, maybe, and take some self-defense classes too, okay? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but but in that, that between that and the agent dropping me, I just said, you know what? I gotta get my life together. I gotta get my life yeah, together. Yeah. And um, oh, beautiful. Thanks for sharing that because yeah. it's always, you know, to make that leap, uh, there's got to be a strong reason. And then for you to just stay, you know, thirty-eight years sober. Well, I take incredible. it really serious. I take it really serious, and you know, if I got beat up by a woman, I would take it serious yeah, too. That's exactly what it is. <laughs> that's exactly. She actually said that to me. So you just got beat up by a woman, didn't you? <laughs> said, well, you know, what was it? Hit your back? You know? <laughs> no, I I take it really serious. I, you know, I I, I really believe sober and clean life is you know and and then when i got into filmmaking I, it really it behooved me so well i always say you know i never have spent one day thinking oh i should have been getting loaded all through my 30s and 40s and 50s you know i didn't miss anything there it got to that point where it was there's no party out there that i'm missing mm. that going home and just going to sleep sober and waking up sober it's the best thing in the world it really is. 100%. So you got the agent back. Yeah, I did. He ended up, he was my, and then he died of a heart attack. But oh. yeah, I had nothing to do with that. But but yeah. All the stress he <laughs> gave him. <laughs> but yeah, I did get him back. And, and no, I, I really, I've been very lucky. You know, I've, I've, I've been working pretty much nonstop since Your whole I was life. 17 yeah, years yeah, old. Absolutely. You know, I mean, I've had yeah. dips and valleys and a couple of years where I w wasn't doing as good as I did in other years, but I've. I'm just always, I've just always been working. So you were doing stand up, and uh, you were also writing screenplays. Yeah. What was the event that brought you into production, to producing, to directing? How did that transition happen? There was a guy named Larry Bresner, who was Robin Williams's manager, right? And he was really nice to me and was helping me out and. I showed him a story that I wrote about my family's, a real life story of my family with my dad and his two brothers and their grandfather. And he said, look, I'll, I'll help you develop that as a screenplay. He got it made. It was called Coupe de Ville. It was a, a universal film with Alan Arkin and uh, Daniel Stern and, and Patrick Dempsey and it's some really good people, you know, and it was my screenplay and I was a co-producer on it. And he just taught me, said, be on the set and learn every day. And Joe, a guy named Joe Roth directed it, who was the head of, went on to become the head of Disney. But Buddy, he, you were raw talent. Yeah, yeah. In your, in your early 20s, yeah, you wrote yeah. a script, The yeah. Universal Bot. Yeah. Uh, it was That's really, incredible. Yeah. Yeah, I know. It, it, was, it was pretty incredible. It was pretty incredible. And, and what would you say um, was your writing gift? Like, uh, at that age, what was the motivation and, and the energy that was making you write the type of stories? I was telling true stories. Okay. I was telling stories. Like, that was a story of my, that was a... a story that was told around the table at holiday dinners uh, uh, the time that my dad and his two brothers destroyed their father's car on the way down to Florida and you know and then I did a movie the next movie I did after that Disney gave me this big deal they no I'm sorry the first movie I directed was a little three million dollar film called Crossing the Bridge 
And it was Stephen Baldwin's first movie, Josh wow. Charles's first movie, David Schwimmer's first movie, wow. all these young guys. And it was about it was about me and my friends growing up in Michigan in the early 70s. You know, it was a real story about some trouble we got into trying to smuggle some drugs across the border, right? <laughs> and um, and we made it for nothing. And I basically had total control of my first movie. And, and the oddest thing, my agent got, Michael Eisner and Jeff Katzenberg to watch it one night and they both flipped for it. They said, this is like our childhood. Let's buy this movie and let's sign this guy up to make other movies. It was like the dream come true. You know, I didn't even, at the time I tell you it now and I realized, wow, that was pretty bizarre. Wow. But they gave me this. Yes and no. Yes. In the sense of what a great hit. No, in the sense that you were making things, you were putting it out there and the universe was that, that energy was, was attracting some people to it and they were the right people. So your, your, um, movie career started from there and, uh, you completely stopped stand up. Yeah. So how old were you when you completely just said, you know what, I'm going to focus on my Probably filmmaking. 31 or so. Okay. okay. Yeah. So you did, you did Plus I had kids. No, yeah. I didn't have kids then yet. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, but you performed stand up from your from 17 to 31. Oh yeah, all around the world. Okay. Oh, wow. I, I had wow. an HBO special. I had wow. I had I did every talk show you could do. I opened for people in Vegas, and I had a, I had a I had a good career. But I, I but again, I I had about 30 40 minutes, you know, and and then when I'd have to do an hour, I'd just milk it, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but it also sounds like screenwriting was such an organic, uh, easy thing for you. For Like you, you said, when I finished the, the, the script, I the, loved the, the blank page was exciting to, you know, to start writing again. That says so much about why your scripts were good. Yeah. And, and then you get into this world of movie making, which is, which is so much pressure. It's so much, there's so much competition. There's so much pieces to this puzzle. It's not just one, it's not a one side. So you, you wrote, you produce, you directed, and then you starred in your own movies. Some of them. Some yeah. Of them. Yeah. I saw, and, and you, you look different in every yeah, movie. Oh yeah. I yeah. feel like you, t you like to play. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you yeah. like the versatility in, yeah, in yeah, each, yeah, yeah. each film. Tell us a little bit about the challenge of being the director, producer and going, all right, all right, guys, this is my part. Okay. Uh, Hold on one second, and then you just, you know, it's your scene and you got to go in and, and put on the actor's hat. Yeah. I mean, originally the smaller movies that I was making uh, that I was in, it just felt like an extension of stand up comedy just to do your own thing, you know? And I, yeah. I, I like being in control and I loved, and, and I, yeah, I, there were a couple of, of the times I thought it's just easier to, than to go hire an actor, just do it myself, you know? And I was do, getting a lot of work. Like every year I would do a TV pilot for the network. So I was getting work as an actor, but nothing that I loved, mm -hmm. right? So, mm -hmm. And it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, a, a, no project came about to, to take your direction, you know, all the way to acting. It no. was, you, you know what I mean? Because it, acting is always, acting needs a hit. Like you could be a terrific yes. actor, but you're not hitting that one project. The closest I ever came to that is when I had made this little movie called The Search for John Gissing with Alan Rickman and Janine Garofalo and some really great British actors. And HBO bought it and they said, and then I had made another movie called The Sex Monster with Mariel Hemingway that won HBO Comedy Arts Festival in Aspen that they used to do every year. It won Best Picture, and I won Best Actor. So they said, why don't you do a show for us? And I did a show called Mind of the Married Man, which was a, they were calling it a male sex in the city, but that's not what it was. It was more about just how guys talk when their wives aren't around, you know? Okay. And, um, and that was the one that really just took me all the way into acting, and, you know, and it was on for two years. But it wasn't a hit because I found out that was the third rail of American comedy. You know, nobody cares about married guys and their sex problems. You know, <laughs> or this, you know, it's like it's women. It's all it's so interesting and freeing. You know, and, and but but it's like you you talk to a bunch of married guys and go, yeah, I have really moved. I'm just obsessed with my assistant. <laughs> you go, that's just creepy. <laughs> you know, and but. 
But we did it with fun. It was written by myself and Rich Scheidner and Bob Nickman, a bunch of comedians. And we were having, and guys loved it. And before it came out, everybody loved it. I mean, it was going, the oh. Steven Spielberg and Seinfeld and all these people were like, were uh, calling HBO saying, hey, we saw that new pilot for your new show. It's the best. I love it. And, but then came out, man, reviews, they were just slamming us. You know, uh. we, this was 2001. So it was long before Me Too, but we deserved to be Me too <laughs> So it was becoming more of an era where they were becoming more aware of this sort of language and, and uh, restrictions. And... Yeah, but like I say, it, it's, it's like one time Chris Rock did this movie. It was called I Think I Love My Wife. I said, to him, you, you got to come up with a different title. Nobody's going to see that movie. I Think I Love My Wife. You think women want to go see that? You think a guy wants to take his date to his, to that or his wife to that? And do you think a bunch of guys alone want to see? You just, nobody wants to see that. <laughs> and my show had really good ratings. But guys would tell me, I hear this all the time, go, I have to pretend I'm sleeping when my wife walks in the room and your show's on. <laughs> she asked me, is that how you think? Is that how you think? You know, <laughs> no guy ever watched Sex in the City with his wife and goes, uh, so do you blow guys in the bathroom? What do you, you do that? They just go, no, okay. All right. That's a TV show. It's funny. But, they, but women took my show so serious. HBO, all they wanted was good reviews. They didn't care. They didn't really even care about ratings. They wanted awards and reviews and and. And that's not what we were getting them, you know? We were getting them ratings. So generally speaking, we can say, uh, again, acting wasn't the number one priority of all the stuff that you had. More was the filmmaking part. No, it wasn't. It really wasn't. And then what happened was I left after the second season and I did this movie, Upside of Anger, mm. where Kevin Costner was the star and Joan Allen was the star and and Evan Rachel Wood and a bunch of these young women. And I just had a really small, and I, I actually, the part I wrote, I offered it to Sam Rockwell. I didn't even want to be an actor in the movie because, uh, uh, you know, but he, he turned it down. And finally, the producer just go, why don't you just do this role? It was a fun role. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a really fun role. It yeah. was the skis ball. You had the mustache. Yeah, going, yeah, 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 yeah. But, um, and then uh, I, I did a couple more where I put myself in a small role just just to, because the actors knew that uh, in me as that. And then I just said, you know, I don't even want to do that. I, I, and I would get like, like I went off to make this one movie as just an actor. I made this movie with Keanu Reeves and Robin Wright Penn. And I was just sitting on the set. It's just an actor. I was so bored. <laughs> I was so bored. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm, it was... You know, I'm sure if you have like a great role, but I was, you know, I I, I was the lead's buddy, you know, and and. Uh, well, I say I put it like this: I feel like uh, when you start making movies, and you start understanding directing, you understand uh, the shot list, your your communication with your DP, your team. Your mind has to be on so many different things at one time, right? So you're you're involved and entertained so so much so you know so much more than when you're just acting. Well, I'll tell you the best way I can describe it to you. Okay. When you're directing every day as a director, I look on my watch and go, "How the hell is it five o'clock already? No way, no way!" And as an actor, you're going, "It's still nine <laughs> You know, it, it, the days are so long. They're just waiting. And, yeah. you know, and then even when you do something, you do it for an hour and then they go back. Whereas, like you say, there's just so yeah. many plates spinning in your head. I'm not kidding you. Every day directing, I was like, how's the day over? There's no yeah. way. And I, I could I could have gone another 10 hours if the union would have let me, you know? It's true. And that's why I feel like as a creator, you, you tend to just say, hey, you know, I love acting and I did it and I'm good at it. But I this one just keeps me going so much more. It's in, in, in your brain is so much more entertained and you're so much challenged, really. 
the world is your challenge. You have a vision. You want to make this vision into reality. Now, this is fascinating. Um, and, uh, and, and this happens to a lot of uh, actors who become filmmakers. I think they, they, yes. they go into business because they're attractive to acting. They're attracted to filmmaking and storytelling. They Once they go in there, they go, well, let me make this movie so I can act in it. And then they make the movie well, and they go, well, me, wait a minute. I let me went just into make the movies. business because I wanted to get out of Detroit and, and meet women. <laughs> okay that was i swear to you I, but i was young you know yeah, yeah. And, and i i fell in love with it later you know it, it you're absolutely right as an actor you start to, and then you start directing and producing and it's just so much more vital and it's but it's also so hard and it's gotten so much harder i guess it's just a combination of being my age and being a white guy and i don't i don't know i just it, <laughs> it's so hard to get my movies made it got harder for me in the years there's a combination of being my age being a white guy and you know in a an in industry that's that's bringing in other voices and you know and and i and plus i also only want to do what i want to do that's the the truth is i've been my own worst enemy on that level because I only want to do th projects I love. But that part is because you, know? you were a stand-up to begin with. Well, that I feel my, like that's what we all have in common. That's my point. What I was saying is one of the things that early on with stand-up, you you you're putting your own show together. You you have final cut. You have everything. You know, and mm -hmm. I had all these years away from it, right? And when I got back and I started, you know, what really what really uh, changed everything for me. I was making this movie with Kevin Costner and Octavia Spencer called Black or White. And there was a role for Kevin Costner's law lawyer, best friend. And he thought I was going to do the role because I had done that other roles and thing. And he loved my show. And I said, no, no, it's not where I'm at right now. And so we, we, were, we had all these actors that we went to, like Jason Sudeikis and all these guys that were going to do it. And then at the last minute, we didn't have an actor. And I had, was building a house, and my friend is the, was the builder. And he said, do you know this comedian, Bill Burr? And I was like, no. He goes, well, you say you know, you're Mr. Comedian. You don't even know Bill Burr? I said, who is he? He goes, he's a YouTube comic. Right? This is back when he was just, I said, why would I know a YouTube comic? <laughs> you know? I didn't even, and, and then one night, I, he comes out on Conan, and I'm watching him, and I call my manager, who happens to says, he's with our company, <laughs> you know? So I got his number, I called him, I said, do you want to come do a movie? I got Kevin Costner to watch him on Conan, mm -hmm. right? I said, yeah, let's do it, let's go for it. So I called Bill, I said, can you want to come down to New Orleans and do two few weeks on this movie? And he said, well, do I have to read? I said, no, you don't have to read. Just get in the plane, get on the plane and come down. He said, well, I got to cancel a bunch of club work, but I'll do it if it's, if it's real. And I said, all right, well, get on a plane. And he came down and we rehearsed for a couple of weeks and we just got along so well. And we'd go smoke cigars at night. And he started, we were talking like, about stand up again. It's the first time I had talked about stand up in 20 years, but I just wasn't interested in it, you know? And so when we come back, I go see him at the comedy store, which I hadn't been at in 20 years. And I was originally one of the guys at the comedy store, you know? And it was packed. And, and then I went on Mark Marin's podcast and he didn't want to talk. He, he wanted to talk about the early days of the comedy store. I said, no, I don't want to talk about that. I got a book coming out, I got a movie coming up. I don't talk about that. He goes, no, we're talking about it. <laughs> and we talked for an hour about the early days of the comedy store. And, and between Burr and Marin and then Peter Shore, I, the owner of the comedy store, Mitzi's son, said, call me, said, you, you should do the documentary on the comedy store. And it brought me back into that world. And I, right as I was, not that I, I don't want to make movies anymore, because I do, and I'm working on a few things, but I love how empowered you guys all are now for you to have your own show here, for you to make your own concerts and your own films. That's what I always wanted. I always wanted that freedom, you know, and I've, I did it in a different way with independent films, but why did I give this up? You know? 
and that's how I ended up back up on stage again because I thought, you know, if I'm going to do this and if I'm going to somehow get back into comedy and or do the, some of the concerts I used to do and the, the things that I used to do with my friends, I better have an act, you know? <laughs> I better get I better get my sea legs back. But your act is so good right now. And that's how we ended up sitting on these chairs right here. It was because I saw you at the comedy store and at the Laugh Factory. Uh and I was like, wow. I, I really genuinely because I heard you on stage saying, Oh, i I haven't done this in so many years and I just came back and I listened to your material. I'm like, this is such a real, authentic, good, funny material. Oh, and you were you. so humble about, you know, oh, I'm being rusty and uh, I'm just, uh, you know, slowly coming back. But then you were delivering a great set. Well, the thing, well, thank you. But the other thing is, first of all, I interviewed 100 comedians hmm. for that five-part series I did for Showtime. I've been, you know, I've been around now and I've learned a lot from you guys. You know, I've learned but I work really hard at it. I'm not, when I say that, someone goes, well, who doesn't work hard at it? I didn't work hard at it. When I was a kid, I didn't work hard at it. I just, I was good. I was, and I was loose on stage. And I, I, so many of my sets were, what do you guys want to talk about? You guys got any, you know, uh, you know, or messing with the crowd. And, you know, I wasn't working on an act, you know, and, and Leno used to say that to me. Len, I was friends with Jay. Jay Leno was like my big brother in comedy when I first say, put an act together, Binder. <laughs> and then when I stopped doing it, he goes, why'd you drop your act? I was, so you said, I don't have an act. <laughs> but, but, but I, now I take it serious. I'm, I write every day. I never go on stage without at least trying two or three new bits out. Nice. I never, I wouldn't, I, w I actually said that the other night and I got a laugh. I, I said, that's a new joke. I had to do that. He goes, if I don't have a new joke, there's no point in getting out of bed, <laughs> you know? But I really, I, there's no reason for me to just come and do all the stuff I know is going to mm -hmm. work, at least mm -hmm. right now. Yes. Because I'm building up the new hour. The first hour, I don't do anything. There's not one joke. There's one joke, actually. There's one joke, but from what I did 28 years ago. Which one is it? It's the joke about the lady waiting in line at Starbucks. Okay. It, it says, um, do I look familiar to you? You're the father of one of my kids. It's yeah, a funny joke. Yeah. You know? So That's I mean, a very funny joke. Yeah. That, that's really the only one. Well, I'm going to use that joke and we'll insert it here. Ten years ago, I was at Starbucks waiting in line. Woman in front of me, he turns around and says, Do I look familiar to you? <laughs> I said, No. I said, I should. You're the father of one of my kids. Oh. Right? Oh, gosh. <laughs> I just looked at her, I go, finally, I went, the hooker in Vegas? Because <laughs> I wore like two condoms. <laughs> She said, no, I'm a fifth grade teacher at Canyon Elementary School, <laughs> and you're the father of one of my kids. <laughs> I love that joke. But, That's very funny. But everything else is brand new. The other side of the thing that I really love about stand-up today, and this is why I have so much respect for you, and why I think we get along, because you could tell that it's genuine, that I really respect what you do. I like the idea of people that aren't waiting for a gatekeeper to let them into the gate. Mm. I like people that just go, hey, I want to create my own world and have everybody else follow me into my gate, right? And the people in comedy, if you think about stand-up comedy, those are always the most successful people. They're always the most successful people, no matter how long it takes to get there. They create their own world, their authentic voices. They go, they just lean in, only do what they want to do. And eventually the world finds them. But yeah. stand up has never been more amenable to this because you can create your own podcast, create your own little projects, movies. You know, that's a gift for us comedians uh, that we do create our own world. And we do realize that uh, there's no better feeling 
than telling the story that you want to tell. That's right. Instead of standing in line, try to be a part of somebody else's story. That there is an empowerment that that make, that that motivates you to start creating and and making that world. For me personally, um, I feel like I was I didn't have a choice but to do that because uh, being Iranian wasn't really uh, anything special in Hollywood, um, you know, and and it was very hard for us to to fit in anywhere. I was, and for me in particular, I wasn't white enough to play the, the white guy and I wasn't brown enough to play the brown guy. Well, listen, guy. no offense, Max, but yeah. every, but nobody had, nobody who does what we do, car, bush, I call it bushwhacking. <laughs> do you know what bushwhacking is? Bushwhacking, a bushwhacking. is, a, is a, a camping tour where you, you can either take the, the, the trail that the park's laid out for you or you can go and bushwhack your own trail and just, it comes from, you know, bush, okay. make your own trail. I thought it's a porn reference. No, no, it's not. <laughs> bushwhacking. There is one. There, that's a different kind of bushwhacking. <laughs> but, um, but, but nobody who does that does it unless they have to. If you mm. get into show business and you get a hit sitcom and you, then you get movies from the studios, you just do it. But everybody who creates their own world, Matt Damon and Ben Affleck wrote Goodwill Hunting because nobody would hire them. They were two morons from Boston. They were extras in movies. And they just said, let's just make our own movies. Mm -hmm. And there's 30 versions of that, you know? And I'll, I'll tell you the funny thing is, I have a son. I think you've met, I don't know if you've met my son or not. I haven't but, met him. But he, he's 29 years old really talented when he was 18 and he told me he wanted to be an actor i just my heart sunk you know because the parentheses is there's a lot of iranian actors that are just actors they don't go and say okay well it's hard no one's taking iranian serious i'll create my own world they're going all right well i'll stay here at the restaurant until i get in a movie part right <laughs> you know what i mean absolutely and and, and they they don't think big enough so my son wanted to be an actor and i just my heart sunk because that's a horrible thing to want to be as an actor <laughs> you know <laughs> i really I, just a horrible thing you know because i never saw myself as an actor i mean because i was a comedian and then i be, did some acting and you know a filmmaker and then i saw him he made a little short that he put on youtube as a kid as a 16, 17 year old kid, and I saw it, and it was great. He was great in it. It was funny. It was. He wrote it. He directed. He acted in it, and he went to college for film college in Boston, and he dropped out three years in. Mm. I got to tell you, Dad, I'm not going to go. And I said, Don't. Good. Fine. And everything else. Just come. And he, I did. I was making this movie in New Orleans, and he was the low level AD guy. Mm. but he still wants to be an actor, still wants to be an actor. But I said, but you, you don't want to just be an actor. You want to, all the other tools too. And sure enough, I mean, he just did his f first movie, you know, a little small little movie, but he wrote, directed, and, and act in it, and he had some really good actors with him, and he shot it in 10 days, <laughs> you know, but it's a feature film, and you just see his, He's got a different energy than, than his other actor friends do. He's thinking about making films and, you know. And, and telling stories, yeah. And telling stories. You know, there's a maturity that um, it comes with, I think, age and creativity. And, in, and it tells you, again, this is not to say acting is not... Not, not to put down acting. Now let's to, put it down. Say, <laughs> They're just say. a bunch of namby-pambies. <laughs> Yeah, Come on. There, there, there let's are. Take the, let's give it the wild truth. Yeah, okay. <laughs> no, I'm Fine. kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> Fine, all you actors. <laughs> no, but, but to say when you, again, taste the control of the creation that, that, you know, that's coming from, your, from you, it's your vision, there is a massive gratification in that. Now, actors are so important to tell this story also. Right, right. And there are levels to acting. There, there are actors that they that they're playing characters that are, um, you know, they're they're not so complicated characters, but they're also actors that, that they have to go and and spend a lifetime 
studying and 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 really diving into these psychological sense. If you're willing to do that kind of work to portray such powerful characters, boy, that's amazing. Hey, and they're great. Listen, the Daniel Day Lewises of the world, they're great. But there's about four of them out there. And everyone that I really respect, like a Kevin Costner or an Adam Sandler or a Ben Affleck, they're good actors, but they're they're thinking so much more than just about acting. They're they're storytellers, they're filmmakers, they're artists, you know? I have, do have respect for someone who's just, I'm an actor, you know? But can you do that outside of my living room? <laughs> you know, because I can't be around you too long. <laughs> no, like, but as a father and as somebody who made movies for years and knows the business so nitty gritty, I can see when your son said, I just want to be an actor, you were like, ah, oh, the business. There's so much more to this business. Of course. And and now you're happy to see him now, also being able to see that. No, I I relate to you because I I have some well, my own family members that 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 I had the same conversation with. You know, uh, but it's also like this young. You, when you're young, you look at the movie and what pops. The only thing that pops about a movie is not about. Like, they don't say what lenses did they use in this. Or, oh, look at that shot! The camera is put in this angle, or that's a dolly shot, or no. They just look at these characters, and they're so attractive, and the way they they portray and they make you feel. But I didn't. I didn't. That's the only thing I feel really good. Okay. I looked at Woody Allen. He wrote and directed the damn thing. Albert Brooks. You know those guys. They, 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 you know Albert Brooks was like. Great comedian, great albums, great movies that he wrote and directed. So, you know, I I wasn't thinking, wow, that guy really became somebody else, <laughs> you know. I, and to <laughs> me, I, I think, the, you know, the people I really respect, also like Tom Cruise, man. Look, at, he's the same guy in every movie. He's the same guy in every movie. He brings himself to the to the the screen, but that guy is a storyteller that guy is a filmmaker i don't care if he makes his living as an actor that's not what he's doing mm. he is telling the stories you know yeah. he mm. you know and i and i respect that and and the guys that i can't i left home at a really early age to be one of those guys i just didn't leave home to get on a show and you know and to stand in line and, for yeah the to, next or, or to go to auditions yeah, and yeah. you know i just I, I never did good at them you know i just never you know and that's the beauty of stand-up comedy mm -hmm. we didn't have to we were on sunset boulevard a few nights a week and all and the casting directors were all coming to town so they they knew us as funny, you know? That's how I became a stand-up comedian. Yeah? I was an actor, and somebody said, you know what's the best way to be seen by cast and directors and producers? And I was like, how? They said stand-up comedy. Apparently, they all go to comedy clubs and watch the comedians. Yeah. If you do stand-up, maybe they'll see you there and make you an actor. I was like, oh, okay, well, I'll give that a try. Aren't you lucky? <laughs> Aren't you lucky? And then I tried stand-up. I'm like, oh, freaking, I love this. This is incredible. Now, speaking of stand-up and your comedy store days, who were your closest friends at the store? Well, when I first got out there, I, uh, Jay Leno was kind of took me under his wing. I hung out with him almost every night, you wow. know. And uh, but I, and and Bob Saget and Dave Coulier was my roommate. You know who Dave Coulier is? Yes, he was my roommate. And Bob Saget and Gary Shandling were at my house all the time because they were Dave's best friends and. These guys were all, I mean, Bob Saget was one of my best friends uh -huh. since from the time I was 19 till last year, you mm -hmm. know? But, and we all stayed close. I mean, even even if I didn't see the guy, for, a guy for a year, I was off doing a movie, it was like nothing happened, you know? And like Dave Coulier was the best man at my wedding, you know? And he's my kid's godfather. Uh -huh. Let's talk about Mitzi Shore. Mitzi Shore, if you don't know, the co uh, owner of Comedy Store. She was the mentor to a lot of comedians. She's one of the biggest names uh, of stand-up comedy, we can say. She yeah. she ran the Comedy Store for many years. And 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 you said she uh, bailed you out of jail. So she loved you. She was close to you. Yeah, but, she was really um, good to me. I guess, tell us your relationship. Like, how, how was... Well, I met her. Look, I came out here. I just, I was 17, and I had just gotten out of high school. I left high school and drove out here 
And uh, I, I lied and told my parents I already got a job at the comedy store. I was so sure I was going to get one. <laughs> I went out on amateur night, the first time ever that I, that I was ever at the comedy store, and I killed. Wow. I, I just got very, very lucky, you know? I mean, when I was doing that documentary, these people would talk about they were, it took them five years to be a paid regular or 14 years. And I w went up on a Monday night, and I, went, I couldn't wait. And I got, and I had been doing it like back at in Ann Arbor and at college towns okay. and stuff in in Michigan as a as a little kid. I went up, and I I just got lucky because I bombed almost every night afterwards for about three months, right? But that first night it was packed. It was a Monday night, and I don't even back then they would just pick your your name out of a hat or something. I don't even know how I got a great spot, but it was packed, and I killed. And I really had no act, <laughs> but I killed. And she, they said, "Hey, Mitzi wants to talk to you." I go, "Who's Mitzi?" <laughs> you know, come on, come on. And and she just and she was, at the time, she was probably in her forties or something like that, maybe maybe forty five or so. But she and she had a bunch of little kids, and she said, "Oh, what's your story?" I said, "I just got out here from Detroit like three days ago. What are you doing for a living?" I said, I don't know. She goes, all right, well, you can work for me, you know, and you and you and I'll put give you time spots when I can. And I just immediately it was it was the right time because the store was just it wasn't a legendary place yet. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And uh, I was a doorman, and then during the day I babysat her kids for her. Oh wow! You know, Paulie and Peter. Oh I, I, wow! I was like their babysitter. Oh my God! And I'd pick them up at school, <laughs> and I'd drive them to their to their hobbies and stuff. And you were Polly Shore's babysitter. No I, wonder why he's so fucked up. <laughs> I know, man. Oh, oh, it's really fun. I'll tell you a funny story. I uh, tell us how Polly Shore was as a baby. <laughs> oh, he was crazy. He was, <laughs> was they the both same. were crazy, but Polly was nuts. And he was. He, there were times when we'd sit around Mitzi's living room, smoking pot, getting high. Richard Pryor, Robin Williams, all these people, you know, and and you'd look over and there's Paulie just sitting there in the corner listening to everything, you know. <laughs> and she go, Paulie, go upstairs and go to bed. She, he said, I'm not tired. I'm watching. I'm listening. Leave me alone, you know. He wanted to hear everything, you know. And but I recently, when I got back, I've been having my some of my friends. I, they go out and I like the middle act for them just to get back out there. So I'd go out with, with Paulie, like Omaha and Idaho and, you know what I mean? And he just packs them in there, you know? Oh, interesting. And uh, so I would go every night, I'd say, okay, folks, I'm going to tell you a little success story. I said, I left home at 17, got a job at the comedy store for Paulie's mother, Mitzi Shore. My first job was babysitting Paulie Shore. I went on I've had my own TV series, I've had movies, I've won awards, done everything, and now I'm back here babysitting Pauly Shore again. <laughs> said, so don't take yourself too serious about anything, okay? Because it's not just it's one big circle life is, you know, and, and the audience just loved it. But it, it was true, man. Here I am on the road and, and watching out for him. Pauly, don't do that. Pauly, come on. Let's go, Pauly, you know? That's amazing. Mike, what happened? recently that you said i'm going to go back and start stand up again I mean, obviously i know the the documentary was a motivation you, you you got back into the world of stand up but what was the trigger point for you to say you know what this is it i'm going to do it i don't know but you know what i think one of them was bob saget dying hmm. i think that really messed with me it really said man life is short you know, I, I, I do a joke on it, but the truth is there's this great Confucius line that he'd say, everybody gets two lives to live, and the second one starts the day you realize you only have one, <laughs> you know? Yep. And yep. I thought, it's really funny, too. It's a funny question, Max, because everybody said to me, like Letterman and Chris Rock and Leno and all the guys I brought back to the comedy store to, as I was interviewing them, they said, you're not doing it anymore? Don't you miss it? Don't you? And, and the young guys, Rogan and Burr, they always, every, almost every person in, as we're in this situation, and I'm in yours thing, they'd say, you don't miss it? And I would go on and on how, no, I love being 
on the other side and I don't have to think about, oh, I do a joke like that. And it's like a magician being able to really enjoy a magic act. And no, no. But then I realized I was full of shit. <laughs> I was lying to myself and to them. Well, maybe you weren't lying. It's just like uh, the idea of putting yourself back on that heat, getting on that stage, that pressure of writing and, and, and pulling it off and the, the fear of like, you know. You're uh, right. You're right. But, you know? but, but, it, but, but I did think, boy, somewhere inside of me, I obviously thought, I wish I, I was still doing it because these guys are great mm -hmm. and I think I could have been great. But I think when Bob died, Bob died really suddenly, and I actually spoke to Bob the day he died, you know, and he mm. was so happy. He was so in love with his wife. He had just, he, he was headlining a theater in Florida. He was so happy. And I gave him a hard time. And then he, he texted me something. He goes, did I piss you off? And I said, no, Bob, you, I've known you too long to know. You know that when you're not being funny, it doesn't bother me. <laughs> and then I said... I love you though. And he wrote back, I love you, brother. And he he died a few hours later. You know, he did a show and then late that night he died. I had been with Jeff Ross and David Tell all weekend in Chicago. And I just wanted to go out with some comedians and laugh. And I love bumping mics, you know? And uh, so I went to Jeff and I just, I said, I'll go with you. I'll hang with you. And we went and I was texting Saget all weekend and I'm on the road again, and we're making jokes about him, and that's how we were talking. The reason I was talking to him on the Saturday night that he died. Sunday, I'm sitting home, and Jeff Ross calls me at like three in the afternoon. I'm in my office. He goes, "Mike, we lost Bob." I went, "Nah, it's not a big deal." I thought he was doing a shtick on me, you know, a joke, mm -hmm. and he kept saying, "No, Mike, Bob's dead." No, oh, I don't want his act. Do you want his act? <laughs> you know, I mean, I, it didn't fathom to me that Bob would ever be dead. Bob was so mm. alive. And he, I was sure Bob was going to be an old guy like Rickles or mm. one of those old time that, that would be in, doing it into his 90s. It really blew my mind. It blew my, it, you know, as much as, as my heart was broken for his daughters and his wife. But I do think, you know, look, he, he, he died in January, and I started up again in June. I had spent the whole thing working on a, a tribute to him that I did for Netflix, you know? And um, someone called and asked me to go up at the comedy store in this show that they were doing of people from my era. And I went, yeah, okay. And it was like three weeks out. And, oh, man, now i got to write some stuff. I'm going to be on stage. And I wrote like 15 minutes of new stuff. And most of it worked. And, you know, it's addicting. I mean, uh, the it's, way I it's, say I mean, it is, Let me just add that. It's an amazing feeling when you make people laugh and you make them happy with what you've written. That feeling it's is amazing. incredible. It's, and I miss... Let me tell you something. You do it one... It's like heroin. You do one thing. You haven't been doing heroin for 28 years. You do one... Next thing you know, you're in an alley blowing people for time spots. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like, whoa, I got to do that again. That, that's a high. It's, it's, yeah. The thing I love about stand-up, first of all, I love to make people laugh. You know, it's yeah. just it's something. Yeah. When, you, when you see someone's body shaking because yeah. of something you said, you know, and, and their face lights up and they smile. It's, it, but, but more than that, when you're on stage, you are so in the now, in the moment. You know, w the reason people like to do drugs, people like to eat junk food, people like to have sex with strangers, <laughs> you know, or new, is because they're, it's right there. They're in the now, right? That's the moment. But when you're on stage as a stand-up comic, your mind is nowhere but that stage. Mm -hmm. How either if you're doing good or if you're doing bad, you're just going. You're focused. You yep. know. I remember I'd have a toothache, and I'd they, the guy would go on stage, call my name. I wouldn't even you think forgot. about my tooth for an hour. Yeah. Come back. Oh fuck, that hurts. <laughs> you know. <laughs> but but uh, it's just so focused. You and that's why. Like I say, why people like to do drugs because it's focused. 
when you're doing drugs, all you're thinking about is getting the drugs, <laughs> getting the, having a drink. You know, you're, you're right there in the moment. And stand-up, you're so alive when you're, when you're doing stand-up. And to me, it, the, the other reason that I've really loved it this year doing it it, it's like putting a puzzle together. You you know this. It's like you go, okay, I got this thing. Now I got to just make that a little better. And that, oh, I think I can, this, this, and then and this should lead to something else. And it's like you're making a movie. You're making a play. You're making a puzzle. And it, it's so exciting to be, and I'd never looked at it like that. I really didn't. It wasn't until I started seeing guys like Louis C.K. and Bill Burr and Chris Rock and Chappelle do one special after another, mm -hmm. you know? And you were talking to me the other night, you are going, well, yeah, I had a new hour. And I'm thinking, you had a new hour? People take that so for granted now. When I was doing it, people didn't have a new hour. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they, they, had, they had an hour, and then they, you know, did six minutes or so on the Tonight Show or this or that, and and... You do an HBO special, but rarely would would anyone else do a second HBO special. No, you're so right, and the pressure is so high now. I think comics literally come up uh, with an hour special every year for sure, because you're touring every year and you're going back to the same audience that loves you, and, and you're you're constantly challenging yourself to write a better hour. You're constantly growing as a person and as a comedian. So, so your your new special has got to be better than your last special. But it must be so hard. I mean, like, like, and I know. I'll, look, it, I'll deal with it. I, I, I got to stay right where I am right now because I'm putting together an hour. But I, <laughs> I just, and then I think, and I got a good opening, and I got a good closing. I got a, I think, what happens when you you lay it down, and what do they, how do these guys do it when they start over with nothing? <laughs> what is, what do you do then? <laughs> You know, I, everybody's different, I think. Like, when I watched uh, the movie Comedian, Seinfeld, uh, came out with this documentary, I realized everybody's brain works so differently because I couldn't, I couldn't relate to them at all. For me, I perform so much, uh, and I'm so comfortable on stage. Uh, I, can, I take a little story. I'm constantly writing you know, on my notes, and I'm like, oh, this this is a very funny story. Oh, that was really that that's hilarious. I take that and I go on stage and I just play it and I record my voice every night. I always record it and I listen to it again. If I play the same bit two or three times and I'm getting laughter, I know this is gonna develop. But I perform I'm performing so many nights in you know that I keep playing the same story and the story gets better and better and longer and funnier. To the point that I had one story of me getting to Vancouver for this charity show and every flight got canceled and I took an Uber from uh, Seattle to Vancouver. And the story of this, this traveling from, from one destination to another with all these events uh, became an hour special. But, you know, it took me uh, maybe about two months or three months to keep playing the same story on different stages to a point that it got so funny and so and, good. And do you and when you were doing that, were you getting rid of all your other material, or are you just doing crowd work, and then you would do that little story? Yeah, I would do crowd work, and I, and I would build that story because the crowd work uh, brings me to the moment, and I gain people's trust. Now I connect to them. Now I'm in the moment. So when I tell the story, the story is told from that energy of being really very authentically connected so the punchlines come easier the story it, it just uh, reveals itself so much easier and more more real and when you do a concert when you go out and you do your concerts do you do crowd work i do crowd work yeah. you do huh? i do about an hour and a half show i do a half an hour or so crowd work a half i sometimes i do 50 50 um the thing is my crowd loves to watch me roast the audience and and they love and and the way i do my crowd work the, it's a story that it comes together at the end i i don't just pick on one person and, and move on i bring them back into the stories that i'm telling i i connect the people to each other and there there is a there's a development off of the wow. crowd work it's it's fun and it's always it was a part of this how my brain functioned from you know i when i got into stand-up 
I was doing a lot of improv in college, and I didn't know what stand-up comedy was. I thought a stand-up comedy was improv. And then when I got into it, I was like, oh, I need to write an act. And, and so I started writing, and some of my jokes went viral on YouTube, and, and that's how my career developed. But that imp, imp, improvising part always stayed with me, and it was just, just how I functioned on stage, and that's how I get excited and and, and allows me to, to connect. And when you write a bit, do you write it out or do you just have an idea and you just never play write it? it out? I've never, I've never written uh, any of the jokes. I and I've tried, uh, and I realized my brain doesn't work that way. When I sit down, to, I'm isolated. The imagination is not there. But I tell you how I do well uh, developing an idea. I usually call friends, and I say, "Come sit around the room." I call two or three comics, and I do a writing session, and I say, "I have this joke." Um, I, I just, I have this idea. And for example, I was telling you, I, I was writing this, uh, material on being Iranian American. So I, I started talking about it on stage a couple of times. I took the recordings. I played back in the room. Everybody listens. And I started talking about it out loud. I go, I feel this way. I feel that way. And I go, oh, that's funny. Take a little note. Yeah. And, I loved what you said to me. You said something interesting that you, you go to a club in Vegas or, and you'll have You'll bring two opening acts, mm -hmm. and you'll give them a little bit extra, and then you spend two hours a day just working. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, we were talking about Las Vegas Laugh Factory. Yeah. And uh, because there's seven, seven nights, two shows a night, and I would take a couple of comics, again, same idea. I would take them with me, and uh, I would record my set every night, and I have five or six ideas that I'm talking about. I would play the recording. Everybody would pitch in some ideas, Everybody say, oh, that was funny. I like the way you did the act out. I would add this punchline and I would take all these ideas, write my notes, and then go on stage again two times that night and, and do the same thing over and over. By the time I came back, I had, you know, 30, 40 minutes new material. Yeah, it was great. I love it when you said that. It's amazing. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. I, I, it's so funny because I never wrote a joke, but... Uh, I'd be driving around, I'd have an idea, or, or, and I'd, the joke would just come to me, and then I'd remember it, or I'd say something funny on stage, and I'd turn it in, because I used to do a lot of crowd work. But this time, I'm not doing it that way. This time, I'm doing it the opposite. I'm, I feel like I'm almost coming at it like a screenwriter, you know? Mm. Even though they're still jokes, and they're, they're stories and routines, I like, to, I like to write it all out and know and have a version of it and know it in my head really well and then I'll go try it and if it doesn't work a few times I'll jump it but if it starts to work then I play around on stage with it but I, I it's like I'm not I'm not like just and, and I know a lot of guys just come up with an idea that they're driving around and they'll they'll work that idea out whereas I've been, the stuff I've been doing is really, I, I know I've got a beginning, a middle, and end to every line. And if that works, then that allows me then to go goof around with it. Mm. You know, like I started this routine about my daughter being a lesbian, which is true. My daughter coming out to the family. And I had a very specific story there, but I've turned it into like 15 minutes. Uh, a lot of it is just, things that I said off cuff on stage. But I do feel like I'm bringing a lot of everything I learned about making movies and, and writing screenplays now, whereas I'm thinking, okay, where does that fit? Is that a good for the later, or for the ending? And, and that's good, but that's going to need something else on top of this. I'll give you a good example. I was walking down the street, and I saw this homeless guy pissing on someone's lawn. I just was, he was just standing flat out, just pissing on this guy's lawn. Just horrible, just messy guy, you know? And, and I thought, I really want to tell this guy off. You know, I want to tell him to hide, hide in the bushes if he's going to do at least. And so I started doing it like that. And then I thought, okay, and it's getting laughs. But, and then I thought, okay, well, this has to go somewhere, right? So, and then I thought, okay, well, what if I told the guy, what if I really was yelling across the street 
And then that was getting laughs. But it, then it started, it just, then I thought, okay, what's the, what's the surprise ending to this? I said, what if he's not, if, it, if I don't have my glasses on, and it's this guy's got a hose in his hand. And he's watering his own yard, and he's thinking, "Man, the homeless people are fucking out of their minds lately, right?" Yeah. And so I, I, it, but I was I was doing that for a month until I got the ending. Wow. And that. So wait a minute, because I heard it when you played it uh, yeah. this last weekend. Uh, so you were ending it where? I was ending it just like, "Hey, man." I get it. You got a big dick. Hide it in the bushes. Okay. There's kids around. I okay. mean it. Okay. You were ending it on the big dick. Part. You know, okay. and, but okay. I, and I was just like, <laughs> I was ending it with me yelling at it. But at one point I was just going to, guys, are, he's a homeless guy and he's pissing. And I'm thinking, man, I'm jealous of him. I'm jealous how easy going he is. I, I got to run home and pee and shut the door. And uh, the, who knew you could just stand in a guy's yard and pit? That was the first version of it, which was the real thing, you know? And it works. But I. It, you made it a lot funnier. Yeah. You yeah. You made it a lot funnier. Now, I, and also your material about your daughter was obvious how well developed it was. And I told you, I said, that sounds like, that's that's just beautiful. I mean, I was, to me, that was the, the most impressive part of your act. Oh, and man. I felt like I wish you ended with that. When I was watching, I was like, ooh, that's just so strong and funny. Because not only it, it's meaningful, not only it's educational, as any family is watching you, is like, wow, and just listening to your perspective, it has, it's such a powerful uh, material that I thought, wow, if you end it with that um, and started with the, the lawn and the underwear uh, bit and, and all that stuff, because the lawn and the underwear, is, they're great material to get to know you for a second. You just go, hey, you know, here I am. I'm here to just have a good time. And, yeah. and you know, here's a, here's a few jokes. And oh, I didn't have my glasses on. And, and here's yeah. the underwear joke when I'm traveling. Yeah. You know, you pack three other. So, and then when you go into the family stuff, they're just really meaty. Uh, material. Yeah, and, and that might be it. And, and as you know, anything, I, I mean, you don't know where it's going. That's what I love about it. You know, I mean, it might be that I end with that. Hopefully, I'll write other stuff that's as meatier to do, you know, because right now I'm working on a whole routine about being 38 years sober. I'm not kind of at the place, at least, and maybe because I was so laissez faire about it when I was younger, I'm not writing like that. I'm really writing in terms of thinking, like, should that bit be there? I think you had said that to me when I was, we were talking. So you, you got an, you do an hour, you know you got something in the middle and you got something in the end. You know, I thought, well, should, I, should that? Yeah. So I'm looking at it more like when I wrote screenplays for years, to this day, it was all just index cards on the wall. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that scene in the other, oh, wait a minute. This should happen later. This, you know, and to the point where I could look at my wall and in my mind, I saw a whole movie. Mm. Right. And I think I'm, and I don't know how long that'll be, but right now I'm trying to bring those tools and muscles into the stand up to help me get back into it and help me write a great hour. This is so great. And it's so educational what you're saying for all of us to hear. Uh, it's a great perspective uh, to bring the filmmaking vision into building an hour comedy special. Yeah, and you know, I, I, I will say, look, there's a million ways to the center mm -hmm. of town, right? A lot of road to the center of town. But there is something interesting about it because, and sometimes like, like I like it. I think I followed you one night and you were doing all crowd work or, or maybe, you know, I thought, I like it when a guy's going to crowd work because I don't want to do crowd work right now. Mm -hmm. And I, and I want to just, I want to put on a show, a little act, you know, I switch with you. That uh, was the second time. That the was first the second time. I, ah, first time I ever saw ah, you. Ah, I didn't remember you, that. You did. Okay. Crowd work. Yeah. So I, at the club, I only do crowd work. Yeah. I found that out why. later. Yeah. I found that because, out later. Because I have fans come to the show yeah and i want to save the material i don't want them to know my act till they come and pay ticket 
when they're watching the show at the theater. So I'm fishing for new material. It makes sense. And I push myself to, once when I'm doing crowd work, if an idea comes up, even though I'm on a roll, I push myself to talk about it to see if I can come up with a new joke. And just in the last week, I've had two or three new jokes that came out. And are they real jokes, of, like one-liners? Or they're, they're short. They're short bits. They're observations. For fun, example, and funny things. They're fun. They're getting big laughs. I made this joke about. I said Indians are the kindest people. If you pick one race, I would say the kindest race is. I would say it would be Indian people. I've never seen an aggressive, mean Indian person. I said they when even they get mad, they want to cuss you out. They're cussing you out with a smile. And I do a whole act. I'm like, are you mother bitch? You actually get out of my store. Yeah, yeah that's so I great. do that. I, it got a big laugh. So and you, I, t- you didn't. That was not a concept you 100% had. Hundred percent in in the audience, great. right? That's great. So I I took that and I go, this is funny. Let me build more on how lovely the Indian culture is. Last night I was on stage and I obviously when you try to something new, you're a little worried, but I was like, let me just dive into it. I talked about and I said. They're, it's such a beautiful culture. They're always so happy. Look at their outfits. They're all beautiful colors, bright orange, pink, and they're wearing it with pride. How could you? How could you not be happy when you're wearing those outfits? Right. And I start getting some laughs. Laughs, and I then It'd be I funny if you went there. No wonder these people always break out into song in their movies. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's <laughs> actually yeah. that's a great idea. Yeah, yeah. Do the do they yeah. talk about the elaborate right, right. dances and the moves? Yeah. And this it's true. If you, I mean, somehow this psyche it. it add so much happiness to them. Yeah. Then I flipped it, you know, being M- Middle Eastern, I said, Middle Eastern's on the contrary. Let me tell you how they cuss you out. When they cuss you, and again, this is this was all riffing in the last few weeks that I, that I came up with these jokes. I said, they make it personal. Americans will say, fuck you. All Middle Easterns, they make it personal. They say, I will fuck you. <laughs> yeah, like, really they they want to handle it. <laughs> that's really funny. I will fuck you. I will fuck you. Like, why are you? What's going on? What made and you? <laughs> why did you have to fill in the blanks? Okay, what was the point of that? Exactly. <laughs> that's really funny. Yeah. So, so I'm using. I will fuck you, <laughs> and I will do it on your living room sofa. <laughs> that's okay. That's how specific the fucking will be. I will use that tonight. <laughs> yeah, the sofa. Funny. I like yeah, that. Yeah, Under the chandelier. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> While my mother is making cooking. Okay. okay? Exactly. Wow. Where, the what's with the detail? Was... <laughs> what's with all the detail? <laughs> that's funny. Uh, that's really funny. That's great. But, but I love that. It's so true. It's like, ah, uh, go fuck, fuck you. Yeah. I, I, I will fuck you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> exactly. Right. And, and so, so when I'm riffing, you know, this is an opportunity when I'm at the comedy club. I see it as a gift to my theater shows. I'm like, okay, here's my gym. This is my time to riff and come up with new material. And also, you know, I live a crazy life during the day. I'm trying to, you know, make these projects, my TV shows, my movies, days evaporate. I get to the club, that's my only time to let go and allow my subconscious to to really come up with new ideas. Right. You know, so it's it's been a blast. No, it's great. It's and like I say, there's so many roads to the center of town. And and I and I do think that I could see myself doing that and coming up with the material that way. It's just it's just not what I'm doing now. It's like like I'm really going up there going, okay, this is the beginning. This is this is what I'm gonna do tonight, you know? And, and I respect that. I think that's know, beautiful. Mike, I know. think that is I think that is the way to to go about it. I think that is the proper. I mean, if if you look at it, uh, if you break it down, it comes down to time. If you can dedicate, and that is the right thing to do, to build something properly. If you're building a house, you, you could it could be your fiftieth house you're building, but you still the more time you put on the 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 paper, the map, how you're doing this, yeah. how you're moving this, it's going to yeah. come out more accurate. Well, I also, you know, even in making movies and writing scripts, I remember what happened was when I wanted to get into screenwriting, I was trying to go to people I really loved, and I listened to this interview that Neil Simon did, and it was about his craft, so I bought it, and he, he kept saying, writing is rewriting. Writing is rewriting. And he, it was the oddest, he had the, he gave the oddest analogy. He goes, people think, when you write something that that's your dick, it's not. 
it's 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 just the sperm. <laughs> you, you're gonna make more <laughs> sperm or something like that. It was like I thought, what the <laughs> hell? That's the most. But but it's so true. He said, don't fall in love with it. Don't fall in love with it. Just cut it off and start over. Yeah. If you if you if you if you had a premise and you wrote the script and no one's by, write it again a different way or re rewrite. It. And I got to the point where I would do so many drafts of every movie before I would shoot it. It, it, the people that I was working with, I would drive them a little crazy, but I just really believed in just rewriting and getting it right and right and right. And that's one of the things that, whether you know it or not, what you're talking about, and what when a comic talks about how he just goes up every night and tries to, he's taught. You're talking about rewriting. Mm -hmm. You're talking about you, you come up with a little mini scene and you do it. And then you do it another way, and then another way, and you add something to it, and you until you go, okay, this is great. Now I do it this way until I, I lock it in. Mike, rewriting is so important. Now I want to add something, and I think uh, you will understand exactly what I'm saying. When you play the same bit on stage night after night, you're also rewriting, mm -hmm. right? Yes. But the, the only thing about it is that it's so beautiful. This is how my bits become so long, is that the, as I'm telling the same bit, you know, I know I know the bit, right? I'm, I'm delivering it. And in that moment, I'm so uh, aware of the moment that I'm feeling it right in that second. Is there anything else I can add? Is there anything else? How does this feel? What is it? I'm, I, as I'm telling the bit, I'm feeling it so much and I add a little thing and I go, oh, I feel like I can talk about it. I didn't see this side. And right away, I take it to another avenue for, for a few seconds. If it's working, I keep going and then I come back to the joke. Right, that's right, that's right. And that rewrite, it, it really is, 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 for me, is so powerful in the sense of like it's, make, it's made my bits longer and really funny because when it's in that moment and it works, it always works. Of course, yeah. It's great. Yeah, rewriting. Yeah, yeah it's great. Um, by the way, can we talk about how great that Laugh Factory room is? Oh. It's just, it's like such a such a warm bath sometimes, oh, you know? Jay Moore, Jay Moore said to me, he goes, it's a little bit like cheating. It's so good. It's such a great room. It's like shooting fish in a barrel. Said, it's not cheating because you still gotta, you gotta, you gotta deliver the goods. But but he's it's right. Such it's a such a terrific room. It's a terrific room. Yeah, it's warm and 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 it's the the acoustic of that room just happens to be magic. Like those intimate small room and the sound just just stays right there. Yeah, it allows you to keep going and and this this is why i love laugh factory because when you're doing your set uh and the energy is so good that feeling allows you to grow that's right it allows that's right. you to take more risks you're right and and when you do take a risk you a lot of times you land it doesn't it doesn't fall flat so you can always keep moving and keep risking and that's what for me that's why i love that room so much if you think about it because I was right there when the first, other than there was the comedy store and the improv, and there was one a place up in San Francisco called the Holy City Zoo. But there, there were no comedy clubs in normal towns when I started. And I saw the comedy clubs start, mm. and now, and I headlined them all for years. But then to come back now, and now I'm going out and seeing them, like opening for Damon Waynes or Jeff Ross or Paulie and... They're gorgeous rooms. They're, they're, and, and there was there's two or three in every city in the country. There's more comedy clubs than there are music clubs. Yeah. yeah. And you know why? It's good you? business. It's good business it, too. It's not good business. <laughs> it's people love to laugh. Yeah, of I mean, course, people of once course. they go out and they go and they sit there for two and a half hours in Boise, Idaho, yeah. and they laugh their butts off. They feel so good. Yes, so true. It's such a, you know, when I, Norman Lear is an old friend of mine. And he, I, I worked with him for him as an actor when I was a young kid. And I interviewed him for this comedy store documentary on a section we didn't end up using about sitcom actors. And I interviewed him just like you're interviewed here. And at the end he goes, 
you didn't ask me one question that I want to give you the answer to. And I said, okay. He goes, at the time he was 98 years old, 98 years. Ask me how I live so long, why I'm in such good health. Mm. I said, okay, why are you live so long? He goes, because I laugh a lot. And I have a lot of funny friends. And I love comedy. And I watch comedy. And I love to laugh. And I never stifle myself from laughter. He goes, it's so good from your system. It gets your blood going. It's like, like sneezing, only a different way, you know? And he went into this whole thing about how healing laughter is. And, you know, it, it just made so much sense to me. Absolutely. When they say laughter is a medicine. Yeah. It's That's so much. true. And I say, you know, because I have this newsletter I do every Sunday off my, on my web platform and i always anyway get your laugh reps in this week you know mm -hmm. go see this guy go see here's the guy coming go see him you know and because it's a beautiful thing and i i think not only have people come to the point where they've realized it in so many settings they've gone to so many concerts you know you know your fans go to your show and damon's fans go to his but more the studios stop making comedies they mm -hmm. used to have once, sometimes two comedies every weekend would open. And you'd go out to the, to the movies and you'd sit there among people and you'd laugh hard. You'd laugh real, I would laugh so hard at some of those, the Will Ferrell movies or, you know? Yeah. They don't do, they stopped. They no, just, you're right. They and also just, the quality of comedy has changed. You know, Liar Liar, uh, Dumb and Dumber, those, those Jim Carrey movies, they're just a big, funny, Loose, you know. All yeah, I wrote. I, I wrote on liar, liar. Yeah, I saw. I yeah. saw on your on your. Yeah, you know, it was, it was, and that was just laughter nonstop. God. You know. How did you get involved? Well, Jim was an old friend of mine, and, and okay. the director was a friend of mine, Tom Shadyak, and it was Judd, me, Judd Apatow, myself, Jim Carrey, and Tom Shadyak. We just re reworked a great idea that these two kids had. God, so, you know? so it was so funny. There was but, but, movies, but um, I agree. You know, but but they don't. You don't have those anymore. There's there's not even really any great television comedy. There's some, but but it's there's no place where you go outside to, at your house and you laugh really hard. Mm. And the comedy clubs and comedy concerts have replaced that, and it's people love it. They're they're only get. It, the only reason that there's so many concerts and so many shows and comedy festivals now is because people are just getting used to mm -hmm. that's a great buzz. Oh my God. And, and good for you to come back and, and really dive back into it. I'm wondering, how did your family feel yeah. when you said, I'm going to go back and start stand up comedy? They don't want me. They didn't want me. They still don't. I mean, <laughs> they still don't. <laughs> look. It's funny you say that because they really don't. And my wife, I, look, and I, I am married to a great woman. She loves me. But I was a stand-up comic when she met me, and I'd go on the road, and, and then I stopped, and, you know, she, she's like, really, we're back to this again? You're going out on the road, and you're this? And they, uh, that's one part of it. That's, but the other side of it is, is I think they just think, because I'm a real opinionated guy. I'm a real opinionated guy. If you started to really ask me about my thoughts on the world and everything, I, I, you might go, whoa, this guy's got some weird opinions, you know? <laughs> and they're like, dad, nobody wants to hear your fucking opinions. <laughs> you're going to get in a lot of trouble. Okay. You're going to, you're going to get in a lot well, of trouble. If and, you and ask I, me, what's the number one, uh, uh, what's the number one qualification to be a great comedian? It'll be someone who's extremely opinionated. Right. That's what I say. And and I said, you know, they go, they go, Dad, you're going to get canceled. I'm going. So be it. What are they going to do? What what, what are they going to do to me at this point in my life? You know, I, that's part of the challenge, is because there's some shit I want to say. Recently, I was doing this routine about uh, how it's a bad time to be a white guy, and you know they're not hiring white guys and old guys, and, and my friends all complain about it, but I don't care. The truth is, I don't, I don't like to complain about those things. Mm -hmm. Because, by the way, when the aliens come, I'm glad we're not going to be in charge. 
Hey, when, when they say, hey, take us to your leader, I go, hey, see that pissed off black lady that used to run the post office? She's running everything now. So go, you go talk to her. I'll be over here with the no responsibility, no reason to annihilate dumb old white guys. We'll be over here singing over, over, over the garbage can on fire, you know? And, and so I'm playing it back. Like you say, you know, and my wife's here in the other room. She goes, you really said that on stage? You really said the thing about old black ladies? I go, yeah, kind of laugh, you know? First time it didn't. The funny thing about that bit, the first time I ever did it, I was down in Irvine. I said, hey, a lot of white guys here tonight. I said, boy, yeah, it's not a good time. We're, this is our last days on the planet. You know, we're, you know, I said, but we've been running downhill for years. Other than the guys in Appalachia and the auto workers and some guys that got cheated, some, some uh, uh, Houston Astro fans that got cheated. It, it's, there's been no problems being a white guy, you know, and then I go into that routine. And the first night I did that routine, it didn't, the black part and the stuff about the black lady and, and all that, silence. I said, boy, if that joke was going to work, this was the room it was going to work in. <laughs> and I got to laugh about that, right? Yeah. But the truth is, it's yeah. not true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That joke works better when there's a lot of black people in the audience because they, they laugh at the head yeah. and B, White people don't want to just be yeah because they because it's a lot of black people in the room they know you're joking and right. it's funny but the, the white guilt and the, on the other hand if it's all white in the room they're like oh, are we saying are something we allowed wrong to be laughing at that. yeah yeah but but so getting back to my wife she'll walk in the room and I'll be playing things she goes you really said that routine about our daughter being a lesbian you got to come see it the audience loves it or my son who comes with me and he. he records me sometime on, on the thing. He'll go, I was just doing this routine about, you know, George Carlin has seven words you can't say on television when I was growing up. There's, I can give you seven words I'm not allowed to even say in the shower alone, okay? <laughs> and I do all these words about retard and, and <laughs> pedophile and, this, you know, all the different, and I'm still working on it. But he was like, you don't want to do that. You don't want to do that. That's... You know, uh, you, you know what I mean? Yeah, totally. They're they're because they're so woke. Worried, my, and they're worried. They're yeah. so woke, my kids, and uh -huh. the, and the, and it's like I'm. Thinking, so I said to my daughter, "Would if you were in an audience and you didn't know me, would it bother you if I was making these jokes?" She'd say, "Yeah, I wouldn't like them." So, well, what about the bit about you being a lesbian? Oh, I love that. <laughs> I said, okay, uh -huh. well, people people like jokes about themselves. I wasn't pissed off when Dave Chappelle did all those Jew jokes on SNL. I thought they were funny as hell, you know? Yeah, because it's, it's also, it all has, it all comes down to the intention. What is the intention of the joke and what is it saying? You know, people know when you, uh, when you're saying, you know, a, a bit that the intention is pure and it's funny and it doesn't mean any harm. That's right. You know, that's right. And, and you know, so so I think that's where, for me, that's where I I calculate. I mean, is this is is it okay for me to say this or is it not? Well, is it is it well intended? Yes. Does it say something good? But yes. to go back, I'm telling you, if I tried out the bit about the Indian happy people that you do to my <laughs> kids, they'd go, Dad, you don't want to tease people from India. Don't do that. <laughs> I, said, I I would I'll actually go. I'm talking about how happy they are. Uh, just don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> if they're so worried that yeah, yeah. because of the culture we live in now. So true. And I, and I want to lean into that. I want to, I just want to be funny. Yeah, no, well, that is the right thing because we cannot, it's never healthy to be so fearful of, of having an opinion. The minute we fall into that trap you know, we're in big trouble. So we should always be able to, and then if it's something backlashes, we learn from it because again, if the intention was not nothing, there's no ill intention, then we go, well, what is it that people are hearing? And, and either the audience grows from it or, or the or the performer, you know, uh, you know, has, has well, epiphany. Well, can I say all oh, the other thing is, you know, people talk about cancel culture and comedians mm -hmm. and stifled. It's bullshit. No comedian has ever been canceled or in, gotten in real trouble for anything he said on stage in a comedy routine. It's all about shit they do off stage 
Or one guy when he at the Laugh Factory was flat out racist, started yelling at black people. He, but it wasn't, you know, nobody ever said, look at Dave Chappelle did all that transgender stuff, got him four more specials. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> nobody's getting canceled stop it stop it it's if you if you slam a girl on a bus stop that was really just on her way home and didn't want anything to do with you yeah your your no, career's I, I, gonna I, hit I, I agree and and i tell you there there is an instant uh for example when kevin hart got canceled from hosting uh the oscars because of a joke he had said i don't know seven eight ten years uh prior to that about his son being gay so he made these jokes and i feel like my son is gay and and, and he used you know he used a couple of words and, and and years later they pull that clip out and they cancel him that is wrong you can't cancel someone for let, saying something let, in a different era and different time let me just say something they didn't cancel kevin hart they canceled themselves who's whose ratings suck now and who's selling out arenas kevin hart that didn't hurt kevin hart at all okay he didn't he he got all the press for hosting the oscars and he didn't have to show up okay <laughs> i love your perspective he's selling out arenas like crazy they the the oscars ratings are the lowest they've ever been and they just get lower and lower every year it was the stupidest mistake that they could have done they had they had a comedian an actor a guy who opens movies he had just opened a drama Dramedy, mm. which is the hardest thing in the world to do, and a comedian, which takes you back to Billy Crystal and Johnny Carson and Bob Hope, and 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 they they let some stupid thing like an old joke, mm. and they were stuck. They were stuck after they couldn't find a comedian for it. When they should have just shut their mouths <laughs> and, and and say, okay, yeah, okay, yeah, the, the, the people are harping on Twitter, but so ignore them. But it didn't. It didn't cancel Kevin Hart, you know? You have a great point. You have a great point. No yeah. comedian gets canceled for jokes, if they're just jokes. Comedians get canceled when they cross the line in some sexual stuff or if they get caught saying something off stage that they shouldn't, that they, other people don't believe in right now. Mm -hmm. But, and that's what I keep saying to my kids. I said, I'm not. A guy that off, if anyone follow me around off stage, they they can't cancel nothing. <laughs> you know, I'm t too boring. <laughs> you know, but but and and nothing that I would say on stage it would offend you because you're worried about me. But audiences, the, yeah. the, the, the they'll yeah. cancel the punchline. They'll go, yeah, that's not funny. Move on. That's right. But they don't cancel comedians. But also, family is is always the the the, the, the not the best judge of this sort of you know what i mean because they're, they're connected they see you completely your, your dad um it's so different of course you yeah. know of course and you know they also it was new to them my I, I, my kids they never saw they, they saw old things of me and people would say to them oh man i used to love your dad on this or on that but you know it's like what is he doing what's he doing at his age going out to the comedy store in the laugh factory in the improv and yeah and by the way comedy you know what's beautiful about comedy it doesn't recognize age no nope. at all i mean look at uh dom it's doing incredible dom herrera just just a, a great comedian great soul great, great person his comedy's always been strong no matter right. when it was uh tom dreesen just a awesome. beautiful person. And look at Steve Martin and Marty Short. Yeah. These guys are, I think they're almost 80. Yeah. And they're out every night. It's amazing. The other side of it is, I think it keeps people young. Mm -hmm. Keeps you alive. Keeps you vibrant. Yep. And it keeps you connected to what's going on. Well, the world of comedy is very happy to have you back. Yeah, Mike. man. I could talk to you about comedy forever, man. I love yeah. it. I, and I... Thanks for having me on this, and for sure. good luck but with this. But before we know? wrap it up, I want to just know where you headed. What's what's uh, what's your what's on your agenda? Obviously, you're doing your stand up. You're doing your one hour special, and you're working to to really have a beautiful piece. Um, and and I want to see how do you see uh, your future projects, and and what's what's the game plan? 
I, I'm real. I have a lot of game plan. You know, I've always, I'm always a, a, a calculator and a planner. And when I have like a great hour, I'm gonna lock it in somehow. You know, somewhere, and I'm gonna just go put it up on YouTube. I'm oh, just, nice. I'm gonna just put it up free on YouTube and and then start over again. You know, you never know where it's gonna land. Yeah, that's right. You that's, never know. That's right, man. This is great. And that's why I was so, when I looked at all, how good your work, that thing you did, I thought, God, you know, it's the most important thing is the stand up, but making it look good is a real important thing, you know? Mm, mm, mm. Thank you, buddy. Thank you. This was such a different, special chat for me in so many different levels. So I'm very grateful of your time, Mike. I'm excited to continue watching you Same and, and, and learn yeah. from you, sincerely. Thanks, Max. Yeah. Thanks really for appreciate hanging this. out, buddy. Appreciate it.